why we do it, but if you're new, let me give you a quick update. We do this because we see it as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and the open exchange of ideas. So you're never going to agree with every single thing that's said in this room or that we have on our shelf or online for you, but we want you to have access to it so that you can learn from a wide range of viewpoints. There are a few more seats in the back, I think. If you have a seat next to you, for the super clear. So we express the same philosophy by providing this space um, for this discussion series. So all points of view are welcome, but we ask that you are respectful of everyone else's opinion and perspective and conduct yourself in a manner that is respectful. If you want to learn more about this topic, we have a lot of resources for you. I know a lot of the books are checked out already. Is that going to bring it back? <laughs> so we have some texts that you are more than welcome to check out and take home with you if you want to learn more. We also have newspapers, online databases, journals that you can take a look at. Before we get started, I just want to ask that once you leave this room, you take two minutes to fill out our survey about what you thought, what could be improved, what you would like to see. We want this to make become and stay a very um, enlightening and enriching place. So next week, two students from SCC, Eddie Mahone and Nicole Martin, are going to be facilitating a discussion called Homelessness, and they'll be critiquing King County's 10-year plan to end homelessness. But today, come on in. Hey, 12 o'clock class, what do we say when people are late? Those are all my students. In the hopes that they'll come on to this. Oh, Fozzie, you get it. You're not allowed to get it. You got it. I'll be pulling in a few more chairs once I get off stage. Okay, so if you want to see, I'll be grabbing a few more. But right now, Caroline Moyer, an English, did I say it right? <laughs> an English faculty member, um, and some of your instructors, will be leading us through a session entitled Beauty as Social Currency. So let's give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you to all my students who are required to be here <laughs> for showing up. Behave yourself. Make me look bad. Um, so I wanted to start with a few questions, and I might be throwing out questions through um, throughout the, the hour. Uh, that sounds like a lot. But um, feel free at any time to raise your hand if you want to dissent, you want to contend with something, you want to bring something else up, um, maybe some angle that we're missing or that we've ignored, please do so, right? Okay, so my first question is, actually I'm going to start with this. What do you guys think, and I think I'll have to have you raise your hand because you're such a big group. What do you think is the definition of physical beauty, physical, so the human form, in the United States for a female? Or really, yeah, let's stick with the United States. What's the definition of a beautiful female? What are their, her characteristics? Is she short? Does she have curly hair? What does she look like? What does the media tell us beauty looks like? Artists. Um, word comes from my Waif. Waif. Waifish. Definitely. <laughs> Extremely thin, underfed, overly delicate, and kind of childlike too. Yeah? Waifish. What else? What are the other requirements? I mean, think of our, our models because we hold them as standards of beauty. Yeah, Stacy. Um, young and, but not, but not too thin, but a little bit of muscle, but right. not Exactly. We have this impossible to achieve in nature recipe, slender yet curvy, right? Extremely tall, 5'10 or so, 5 feet, 10 inches, around 120, maybe 130 pounds if we're feeling generous, right? In general, what hair color do you associate with what the media tells us is beautiful? Blonde hair. Blonde. And is it curly hair? Is it short hair? Straight hair. Long, straight, blonde hair, right? Which some of us around the world are born with, and that's great, but that's not the genetic pool of the entire globe. Some of us will never have long, straight, blonde hair, myself included. <laughs> and my attempts to make myself blonde were miserable. Really bad idea. So we've got this. This is part of the problem here. 
the problem is that we get this idea of what beauty should be from this constant, pervasive, invasive onslaught of media, right? And when we say media, we're talking about magazines, music videos, what else? Where do you get these images of these beautiful women who make us feel, well, they make us feel various things depending on who we are, yeah? Oh, celebrities. Celebrities, definitely. Celebrity culture is huge, especially since reality TV began and we've suddenly got this cult of the celebrity who's famous and celebrated for doing nothing other than being on TV and fitting a mold, right? And the problem is, is that we're telling everyone that beauty is only a, an important idea in the human experience when it comes to a human form. It's only important for women, for the most part. And that there's one specific type of person, and that type is emblematic of beauty and perfection. So if you don't fit that mold, what do you do? If you're not 5'10", and you're not blonde, and you're not young, and you don't have long, blonde, straight hair, what can you do? How can you achieve the ideal? What resources do you have? Cosmetic surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dying hair? Diet. Diet? Mm -hmm. Makeup. Makeup. How do you get taller? High heels. High heels. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> been to, I've been trying to figure out how to get shorter, so maybe we can connect on that. Yeah, so the idea is if the media tells us you have to look this way to be considered beautiful, and if you're beautiful, this is the only way for you to have any worth as a female, then we are stuck in a very, very small box. And the, the actuality is, according to a survey by The Economist, men's, let's see, what is the, men's, men have a savings rate of about 12% of their um, yearly income. So at any time, a gentleman on the street will have 12% of his yearly income in a bank account. What do you think the statistic is for women? Higher or lower? Lower. 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 How much lower? Like, what do you think? Not too many. Four percent? Ten percent. Lower. Seven? Less. Zero. Zero. Seven is bigger than four, AJ. <laughs> no, it's actually negative point one or one point five percent. This is coupled with the fact that women make less than men, even though our abilities are more are increasingly seen as equal, right? We also outspend men, meaning even though we earn less, we spend more. And the bulk of our money goes where? Where do you think? On our kids. Yeah, kids. If you have priorities, right? Exactly. But what about before you have kids? Cosmetics. It's cosmetics, it's clothing, it's practices and products that perfectify or beautify. They help us get closer to this idea of what we are told over and over and over is beauty, and that no other beauty exists. And the problem is, is that it's a classist, racist notion, right? It leaves Latinas out, it leaves people um, in gender transition out, it leaves homosexual people out, it leaves a lot of people out. In fact, the only people it doesn't leave out are Anglo-Saxons, for the most part. And that's not your fault. If you are 5'10 and blonde, lucky you, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that look, and it is beautiful. But there are many other types of beauty, too. Lots of beautiful types out there, right? So just to move back a little bit, I kind of just put this picture there to horrify you. Because the reason beauty is worth talking about to me is because of the effect it has on young women. Death, disease, just moral atrophy, all sorts of stuff. I think that if you continue to tell women that you need to look a certain way, and you examine how the media, well, let's put it this way. So you've got a celebrity like Jennifer Aniston, yeah? Who makes tons of money? She endorses Aveeno products, which are a drugstore brand of skincare line, or excuse me, it's a drugstore skincare line. Every time <coughs> you see an ad, with Jennifer Aniston and her perfect skin that matches her hair. She kind of looks like a golden retriever. But she had this perfect face, no wrinkles, everything airbrushed out, and you see Avino, and she's happy, and she's obviously wealthy. She got to be married to Brad Pitt for a while. She's got a pretty good deal, right? The problem is, do you think Jennifer Aniston, who makes millions and millions of dollars, actually uses Avino? No, no yeah. of course not. She's probably smearing like unicorn blood on her face. <laughs> so, you know, she can afford that, right? But we see this, there's this interconnected international industrial complex. The beauty just, it, I have such a hard time articulating what it is. 
But basically, you've got products being advertised by people who exhibit a type of beauty that doesn't actually come from that product. And obviously the promise is always that you're gonna be happier. Your life as a woman is more worthwhile. You count for more if you are beautiful. Has anyone had any experiences like that or noticed it, either in their own lives or with an associate, a friend, someone being treated either better or worse because of their looks? Yeah, what happened? Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in my school, I baked in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, like, okay. Yes, uh, like we had, the, you know, in our classroom where uh, the most beautiful were, you know, like uh, chosen to be, for example, to stay um, afterwards for like some um, other after. They got special treatment? That are, yeah, mm -hmm. better treatment like right, that. They were chosen to do other things that people like to ask wouldn't qualify. Really? So the teachers saw something in then, the good-looking students that made them believe, or at least treat them that they were somehow better, yeah. right? Anyone else? No, I don't believe you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm kind of like the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, I work at a bar's promoting mm -hmm. promotion, and um, I feel like they almost do worse when I do my hair and wear more makeup. Really? Because the girls control the guys. Mm -hmm. Ah! So they'll get them to not sign up with me. Okay. So I feel like they do always do better, like, trying to... Interesting. Like, yeah. Well, this in. issue, it colors not only how we feel about ourselves, but it also colors our relationships with other women. And I don't know how many of you catch yourself judging people based on their look, which is part of human instinct, right? If you look at evolutionary <coughs> history, caveman coming out of the cave, if someone approached you, and remember back in those times, your contact with other humans was super diminished compared to now, right? Um, you kind of had to decide based solely on how that other caveman looked, whether he was going to hurt or harm you. Is he going to steal your club? Is he going to steal your wife? Is he going to grab that chunk of bison you've been saving for Christmas? Like, you don't really know. So this idea of judging people is kind of a, um, a biological instinct that we have, and it makes sense. But the problem is, is again, that we've become so reductionist. So I'm going to show you, um, is anyone familiar, this is a tough deal for me, I, I guess I should look at the screen. Is anyone familiar with Plotinus, a Greek philosopher? So Plotinus had this, there he is, sans schnoz, but beautiful still, right? The concept that we think of um, when we're discussing beauty now, in 2014, is this idea of sexuality and, and perfection, right? Embodied in one package. But beauty is much, much more than that. And, and it's a huge, huge part of the human existence. And it's one of the parts of human existence that for the most part is always, most of the time, positive, right? What are some of the things you guys think or find, think are beautiful or find beautiful just on a daily level, beyond this concept of, of human beauty? Because back in the day when we had philosophers like Plotinus or George Santayana, speculating about beauty, they saw it as a very spiritual thing, and that human beauty was the lowest form of it. It was the most watered down version. So what's happened is that we've kind of, this idea of beauty being an important kind of spiritual or intellectual or emotional pursuit for humans, it's, it's been destroyed because now beauty is a commodity. It's something you can buy. <coughs> you can attempt it. You can approximate it. You have this cream, this makes your skin perfect, this makes it bright. If you're in a dark a country where you're dark skin, we'll sell you a cream that whitens your skin. If you are in a country where most people are pale or Caucasian, tan, right? United States, Japan, you can look at both of those examples. So what's beautiful besides the human form? Well, I, w I would uh, tend to agree with uh, what he says right there that I just finished explaining. Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, I've seen women that are beautiful by general standards, mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, they got almost that perfect look, that right figure and all that, but then an attitude comes through, mm -hmm. and to me, she has turned ugly. Sure, yeah, mm -hmm. and the opposite can be true too, right? We see someone who might not be immediately noteworthy or remarkable to us, and then upon a conversation or oh, two, yeah. you find that they're just so compelling, so well, beautiful. Precisely, because then they can be the not perfect <laughs> exactly. looking one. But yet, we relate to that. Well, I mean, who isn't, right? Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> who relates but then, to but, 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 then, but then you see that. Mm -hmm. and, and then you see uh, that type of beauty. Mm -hmm. And that's real. 
That's mm -hmm. not like some philosophical thing that's out there that's untouchable. Yeah, it has a real application and use and role in our life, right? But, but I think uh, the media is so powerful in this that we have been conditioned little by little. Absolutely. Men and women alike, uh, certain standards are acceptable, mm -hmm. and then we question the values later. Absolutely. And I think we're at the point now where we have been questioning the values. That, I mean, we were just starting. It's, it's a pretty new process, I think, for all of us. We've known for a while that a model in real life doesn't really look like what she appears, or how she appears in an image, right? There is a team of professionals who make their money off looking, making her look more beautiful in an image than any human being could ever feasibly look in real life, right? And we're talking lighting, makeup, all the stuff that happens even before the airbrushing that we hear about. So we've got, for example, how many of you guys have been watching, yep, oh, Kevin? Or you're yeah. asking about things of beauty. When I yeah, see, yeah. right now in my life, and where I see a man seeing this and that, when I see acts of kindness or acts of love, people helping, I, I like that. that yeah, That absolutely. is something that touches right here, and I like that. Yeah, Jin and I were talking before classes that it's not always the huge things that are considered intrinsically beautiful, like beautiful to everyone universally, like sunset, waterfall, those natural landscapes that kind of speak to all of us. But little things, little gestures. I saw a little girl giving um, a bite of her food to her mom in, in the sweetest way, and it gave me that same feeling that Richard Seymour, um, who's done a lecture on what beauty feels like on TED Talks, my students have watched this, his idea of beauty is that it's a feeling. It has nothing to do with cognition. It's totally a physical sensation that you recognize before you process the thought. And those little things, like a child's smile or someone helping someone who's dropped a book sometimes affect us more than those really grand images like a five-colored sunset, right? Yeah, Katie. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, it, it is very prominent and oppressive to women, but it is also very oppressive for men, men. too. Absolutely. I just want to make that very clear that Good. men are struggling in the same way that we as women are, and maybe Absolutely. in different contexts, but... It's the same struggle, yeah? Right, and yeah. and as women, we're set to different standards and, you know, different things and different things are thrown at us, but men still have these things that they are told they have to be. Sure, and gender roles work both ways, right. for sure. So it's not, yeah. It's yeah, not I'm glad you brought that up. Woman thing. We've talked about that a tiny bit right. in my 101 class, but probably not enough yet. In the past, the, the corollary for men with these painful beauty rituals for women. I'll show you some pictures now. Um, I know that you guys are grossed out by these already, but or my classes. So the Lotus Foot, Tong Dynasty. Am I saying that right? My my ten a.m. students they taught me how to say Tong Dynasty. <laughs> okay, so well, well, one strange thing you might notice right away is that that foot approximates a high heel. And if you look yeah. at a woman like me who wears high heels every day and has been doing so since she was about sixteen. I may not be that bad, but my feet certainly are not as straight and unblemished and pain-free as, let's say, my boyfriend who gets to wear flat shoes with ample toe room every day, right? So we've got foot binding in ancient China. We've got gavage in Mauritania. Mauritania is this great example to put up next to the United States because the United States is a food-rich nation despite the fact that Despite that fact, we still have starving pockets all over the country in urban and rural areas. But we have an overabundance of food. And what's the average American body type? Do, are we a slender people? <laughs> fat. Exactly. We are fat. We are a fat nation. We're one of the fattest nations in the world. So in a country where most people, especially the poor, are overweight, the standard of beauty becomes the opposite, right? If you are thin, it means you have enough money and time to, you know, educate yourself about your diet, make healthy choices, maybe work out, maybe tan, have a gym membership, go to a yoga studio, right? In Mauritania, where food is quite scarce, what do you think the image of beauty is? What do they consider beautiful? Yeah, exactly. Overweight to the point, I mean, clinically obese to the point where there are lots of health consequences, including death. Same with foot binding, right? When you're breaking a five to seven year old's toes every, I think it's every few months, I, I might be wrong with that, and rewrapping them, infection, gangrene, amputation, sometimes death from septus and other sorts of um, bacterial sorts of diseases, things like that. I'm not a doctor, it's been a while since I practiced medicine. So I would say what we've got in this country 
And from this particular video that the still is taken from, there is um, a mother force feeding her daughter liter after liter of camel's milk and millet, a very like dense grain. The idea, and she expresses this so clearly, and it's it's so heartbreaking to hear her. We don't have schools for girls in Mauritania. The only way I can make sure my daughter has a good life is to make sure she gets married. The only way she can get married is if she fits that model of beauty. That's her social currency. And that's what we're teaching our girls, that their worth is based completely on what they look like. That's what the media is telling us. That's the mass media idea. It's not the idea, thankfully, that I see in my students when we talk about this. And I think that for someone like me, I'm pretty involved in the fashion industry, so I'm often working with models, I'm often working in photo shoots and all the deception that goes with that. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at magazines, and I will definitely start to feel bad about myself because I don't look like those girls. I'm so conscious of the fact that they don't look like that too, but I can't help it. It, it is this immediate reaction. Her legs are longer, her thighs are thinner. And unfortunately, it, it does, I think, affect the way you prioritize what you do with your life, right? The good news is when I, I live about a block from Green Lake, so every time I walk around Green Lake, I try to keep track of what I think is beautiful, and it is, has not been yet, I've lived there since January, it has not yet been a five foot 10 skinny girl who somehow also manages to have a large chest and a large butt, right? Because that's the new thing, right? We are super hyper-focused on the butt right now. And that's, <laughs> it, it happens. Every culture tends, as we've seen, these cultures tend, every culture, let me back that up. Someone's had too much. <coughs> Every culture at one time or another has fetishized or kind of gravitated towards one body part and made it the most important. For a while in the United States it was lips, it was breasts for an incredibly long time, and now it's the butt. And the funny thing is Brazil, which used to lead the world in butt implant surgery, I know that's not the technical term, but I don't have time to say butt. So we'll just stick with butt. Gluteus maximum. Gluteus maximum. Gluteus maximum. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Brazil used to have the highest rate. So they have carnival, they have this beach body conscious sort of attitude, especially you know around Rio and Recife and all the coastal towns. And right before carnival, where everyone is very scantily dressed, there would be this very um, intense kind of backlog of patients, women, waiting to have their um, buttocks pumped up. And there used to be a lot of talk in fashion magazines about how Americans could learn something from the Brazilian um, beauty ideal. Look at the Brazilian mannequin. She has a smaller bust and a larger butt. Now we're starting to adopt that philosophy. So, yeah, that is beautiful. And you have girls like Iggy Azalea. Does anyone know Iggy Azalea right now? So she is basically the Barbie type, but she's 5'10", extremely slender, and has an outrageously large posterior for her body type. And this is something we haven't really seen. We have definitely seen African American girls with butt implants. I don't know if you have, anyone has looked at Vice Magazine, but there's this great article and there was an accompanying <coughs> program about the illegal buttock injections in Miami. They are injecting things like silicone, industrial grade chemicals. A lot of the girls who are doing it are strippers who talk in the article about making three times as much money once they've kind of adopted this like fetishized shape. And what's so ridiculous is that these things cost money, these things harm girls, but every few years, depending on where you are in the world, there's like this new idea. You have to be this way, otherwise you're not worth much, right? So we've got this little girl here, um, whose mom, just to circle back, is saying, again, I have to force feed my daughter, I have to make her obese, I have to, basically plague her with the risks of heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, early death, enlarged heart, it, you know, kidney failure, because that's the only way she can do anything for her child. I mean, if that isn't messed up, I don't know what it's. I, I really don't. And this is not to criticize this particular culture or this particular space, because we do the same thing. This, to me, looks like beauty pageants. This looks like American moms dyeing their kids' hair blonde so that they don't look like a fake blonde. Right? That's quite common in New York, in fact. So the, the, the really competitive preschool set, so the, the women, the moms who have blonde hair, don't want people to know that they're not actually blonde, that they didn't win that genetic lottery, so they dye the kids' hair too. And it's a huge concept, if anyone has seen Good Hair, Chris Rock's documentary about 
black Americans and their relationship with their hair, you see very young kids with extremely caustic chemicals on their head because their parents have grown up in a space that tells them, if your kid doesn't have straight hair, if you don't have good hair, and good hair is the opposite of what you have naturally. That's always the case. Natural beauty is never in both. You always have to spend a bunch of money to get the ideal because otherwise the media would collapse. Like if you, if you stopped buying products, if you stopped buying razors, hair dye, makeup, cellulite creams, um, concealer, there would be a huge just economic implosion in the world. It's a $1.6 billion industry every year worldwide. And the sad thing about the cosmetic industry is that none of their products can ever, ever, ever deliver the promise, right? You can lose 20 pounds like the girl in the commercial, you know, she's eating chips, having a tough time, takes the diet pills, suddenly she's in a pink bikini and she's running down the beach and she's got a six pack and she's tan and this gorgeous guy is scooping her up because she's so light and skinny and he's waving her around and swinging her around. And the promise is that you will be happy if you lose weight because that's perfection and perfection is beauty and that's the only type of beauty. So it's getting to be I'm not sure. I've been thinking about this for five or six years now and, and teaching a unit on beauty almost every year, at least once. And I'm still not figuring out whether we're getting better or we're getting worse. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think that, like, let me ask, um, let's see. Well, <coughs> everyone in the crowd. Do you think for a woman to be attractive to you as a partner, she needs to be 5'10", blonde, etc.? No, most people don't. And in fact, I think I mentioned this to my class, I have several um, male friends who have sworn off beautiful women because they're too much trouble and they're too insecure, which makes sense. Because if you're given just like Fonzie, as you were saying, the girls in your class getting special treatment because they're beautiful, if you're treated well and it's obvious that it's just because of your looks, that is certainly gonna color your perception of the world and what you think is important about yourself. Your beauty will be extremely valuable to you you don't need to cultivate anything else. I, my mom told me when I was six years old, about six years old or so, I had gotten into this habit of looking at girls my age and comparing them to me, how pretty they were. And my mom, at one point, I asked her what she thought, and she said, well, Caroline, you're cute, but you're no beauty queen. <laughs> and yeah, right? At the time, and even for years after, perhaps even a decade after, I thought, what a cruel and unkind thing for my mom to say. Doesn't she know how important it is to be beautiful? And now looking at it, she couldn't have said anything better because it did snap me out. I was intent on being a model. I was intent on being a pageant queen. That is all I wanted. I never would have become a writer. I never would have even thought about any of that. But she kind of took me out of the game early. And it did hurt at the time. And she's very blunt and extremely Latin American in her you know, ways of dealing with children. Like she doesn't pull punches. Um, but most of us don't have people telling us that it's not important how beautiful we are. And we can't help but judge. Yeah, Katie. Um, my daughter's four right mm -hmm. now, and she has, you know, her hair is long, but it's curly, curly. Mm -hmm. and big, and she has, she's mixed, her dad is black, so she has, like, golden skin and she's light the, eyes. She's the best of both worlds, sort of thing. Has mm -hmm. very, she's very muscular, and she has, like, a round butt, and it's <coughs> she, the time that she was, like, walking. Mm -hmm. So the time she was on, people were already sexualizing her to a point of look at her butt and look at those legs and she's going to be, you know, a handful when she gets older and you better watch out for her. And even now, you know, she's older and she moves on her own and mm -hmm. she's strong and can mm -hmm. do monkey bars and stuff. But when she does stuff like that, that's the first thing that people comment on is yeah. her hair and her eyes and then her ass and then her skin color mm -hmm. and it's, she's four years old and she's already being looked at as she's objectified a, yeah. yeah objectified as a, as, as a sexual being in the future you know it's yeah like she she's not even there yet right kid but they're already saying look at her ass and you know look at her hair and wait till she gets older it's like it it makes me want to Punch them in the face. Yes, because I'm like, I think you'd be within your rights. Yes, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I feel yeah. like, and they, they don't, I, I genuinely believe they don't even realize what it is they're actually. No, I've like, seen your daughter, and she's beautiful, and that's probably the first thing they see, and then they start picking it apart, because that's what we do, right? Right. We kind of 
it's, it's as if we're at a butcher shop and we're taking like, oh, the ham hock here and the, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's a, a, a bad way to look at the human form for sure, but we do it. Yes. Oh, uh, I was rather frightened to read in a book on, uh, on uh, queer studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the source of it, this particular bit of information, but that in South Africa, uh -huh. black people, uh, so they, they use products to lighten their skin, and this was a reference to the early post-apartheid. Oh, yeah. 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 Post-apartheid. The, the stuff that I found in, in just in deep, deep history researching this, and that's why there's not as many books up here as they usually are, because I checked them all out, and I'm sorry, but hmm. this kind of stuff, lightning creams have been around for as long as anyone can remember, like recorded history. We're talking about like, I mean, cosmetics. Cleopatra used cosmetics. Mm -hmm. She wasn't good enough the way she was. She had to add to it. And she might have been the mother of all that. Who knows? But it's kind of interesting that the woman who first used cosmetics is also considered one of the most beautiful women in history, right? And a lot more people know about Cleopatra, say, than Nefertiti, for whom there is no kind of beauty legend or myth. Yeah. I just have to correct something about Cleopatra. Yeah. She was actually going to be quite plain. Um, all the Roman writers that wrote oh, yeah. you, we know we know about her from, like, you, right? from Greek and Roman writers, and uh -huh. they all said that she wasn't very attractive, but they all said that she was very charismatic. <laughs> really? um, but she did bathe in she bathed in an ass. In the farm blood. Um, Jack ass. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I've heard a lot about her beauty practices, and I guess what I always understood is that she was a, a legendary beauty, but maybe that's an example of us actually seeing how she was, or no. hearing about how she her, was. And also Mark Anthony was kind of ugly, too, so... I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But I have a question for you. Like, yes. um, this picture that you were showing, you're talking about this woman's mother saying that the only way for her to get married is if she's fat. perceived yeah. as beautiful, which mm -hmm. is fat there. But um, all I'm at, what I want to ask is we live in the modern world and we think of ourselves as so advanced living in the modern world and we progress so much. Mm -hmm. and especially like when we think about traditional cultures, mm -hmm. oftentimes we think of them as primitive. Mm -hmm. We think, ha we look back at the past and yeah. say, look at how advanced we are compared to them. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering is if all this stuff today that's happening in the modern world, the beauty of social currencies you're talking mm -hmm. about, it really has a corollary in traditional culture. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I bring up plastic surgery in yeah. the United States or South Korea right now, where you know girls graduating high school will get the eyelid surgery to westernize the eyes. All of these are the same. Different cultures, different people, different times, but the idea is still the same. How you are naturally, not good enough. You need to appear exclusive. You need to have the wealth to achieve that exclusive look. What's different in the United States is the pervasiveness of media, I think in the Western world, and how much one particular brand of beauty that's very holistic is promoted versus that fetishizing of one particular portion of the body. Right, and I was, the last part of the question I get, I don't know if it's a question, but sort of, but in traditional cultures it seems, and a long time ago, it seems like I mean, the idea of beauty would have been very much intertwined with survival. Like Definitely. Who, who passes on the genetic code. Yeah, um, who's fertile and yeah, who's able to bear exactly. children, absolutely. Um, but I mean, in the modern world, that, that's really not as big of an issue for us. That's um, exactly why the, the male beauty standards are changing. Okay. So, yeah, do you, have you seen this? Well, that no, you think men are more pressured to feel, look beautiful now? Well, no, no, not that part. I'm saying, like, you know, beauty is kind of like a, it's turned out to be a curse because men, when they're choosing their women now, they want a woman to be a cook and clean their house and, <laughs> and, you know, take care of their kids and all that beauty that's going to get them in trouble, you know, because you might be the guys get married. Mm -hmm. But back in the 60s, it was a song that came out that said, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, never make, make, never a, make a pretty woman, woman your wife. wife. Yeah. <laughs> Get an ugly girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's some there's some sense to that, right? Um we the traditional gender roles used to be that the, the man's um worth had to be physical, that they were physically strong, able to help. Because as soon as humans started walking on two feet, they could no longer women could no longer carry a baby and hunt a you know, gather at the same time. So they needed to pair bond. And the idea for women who were back in the cave with the baby for umpteen months, they needed a man who could help them and protect them. As history evolved, or as humans evolved, it became that physical strength was not really as important as what other kind of security. What's important for men now? Financial. Yeah, money. And we definitely look at things like cars and clothes to kind of judge a man's fitness. You can take a super handsome guy and put him in a beater car, and he will get less looks than a dreadful looking man in a really nice car, in my opinion. And we've watched The Science of Sex Appeal, which is a great um, documentary in my class, 
and they did an experiment where they had a group of men rated from most to least attractive. They took the most attractive guy, and this guy was nice, like, he looked good. And they put his picture on a big card with um, a, a, an imaginary, a fake income. And they showed it to girls. This guy had been rated as a 9 or 10 as good looking by another panel. They took his picture out to the street with his really low salary, like something like a part-time teacher would make. And they found that women suddenly started rating him 5, 4, very low. The man who was rated as least attractive, and he was very unattractive, I will say to me, just looked unhealthy. Um, they gave him a huge salary, uh, over a million dollars or so, I think. Does anyone remember the exact figure? You remember this experiment, right, from the film? No. He's like, no. Um, <laughs> Software engineer. Software engineer. They gave him, you know, a nice, cushy, kind of middle class sort of job, of more than that, upper middle class. And this guy who had been rated below five in terms of looks, 10 being the most handsome, suddenly shot up. One girl even gave him a 10. So the corollary has been for men is men's wealth. Their demonstration, again, of, of strength and fitness to navigate and protect, right? But since women now are able to have kids without men, and we are, we're still not earning as much as men, but that's not anymore due to a perceived um, mismatch in abilities. So if anyone has seen the new um, Atlantic available at your local library, you'll see that they have this article on the confidence gap and it's looking at women who are really successful and they're also showing that the only thing that really separates men from women now, the basic idea is that we have equal sets of skills. They might be different, but they're equal. The difference is that women aren't confident. We have no confidence, we don't exhibit it. Uh, they're talking to women CEOs of multi-million dollar corporations who say, I don't know if I really deserve the job, someone just gave it to me. So you you're saying that, like the Supreme Court, racism has disappeared, sexism has disappeared, and it's their fault because they're not confident? That's what you're saying. It's very close to that. Come wait, on, what? drop it. Like, I'm saying that? No, I'm, I'm oh, 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 oh. So wait, can you repeat that? I'm not sure I got that. Well, the, the, you're quoting the article, I realize. It's not uh -huh. what you're putting forward. But you're saying that the article says the reason women earn less is not because they have worse skills, but because they're not confident. They, they forgot so about condition. one little ingredient. Mm -hmm. We have sexism. Oh, sure. Thank of you. Of course, of course. <laughs> no, they're talking about that what has changed is that, let, let me just give a little context. It used to be that women earned less, and the expectation or the understanding was we earned less because we were worth less. That attitude is changing slowly, and that's what they're remarking on, but that we're still behind in terms of earning because we are still socially conditioned not to be confident, not to value our work skills. They even did these, um, all these sort of comparative studies where they asked a man, you know, if a man has done something wrong, his response to it is, oh, it's someone else's fault. A woman working on a team, if a team member makes a mistake, she assumes that it's her fault. So yeah, sexism is still hugely in place. Well, that's what, you know, one of the most okay, profound things I feel Archbishop Tutu ever said is the, the worst thing about racism is not the physical violence and the economic violence that is done to people, but the internalized Absolutely. racism. And that's what you're talking about Absolutely. here. So really, I think it's important to remember that in the context of the culture. Definitely. Not I just watched a, a report. Um, they, it was a panel of girls, news, ABC News, um, a Hispanic girl, so a Hispanic American girl, Asian American girl, Black American girl, White American girl, a little panel of darling little girls at a table. They showed them a selection of dolls of all colors and races. Who, what doll did they choose? Uh, the blonde. The wet one. And I remember that growing up. My friends would constantly give me the dark haired Barbies, like Miko or Kira, who are her friends, because they thought I would want that because of the black hair. And it made me feel like I wasn't good enough to get the blonde doll. And I wasn't good enough because I didn't look blonde. That only blonde girls were allowed to have the beautiful doll. It is so packed into everything we do. I mean, this idea that women are weak and just need to be sweet and look good. You can see it in the Hindu religion in certain regions of India. When a man dies, his wife shaves her head in a strip of color. She has to wear all white the rest of her life. She is permitted to cook at family functions, but she's not she's supposed to be seen. And that is actually is a step up. And again, not to vilify this culture or this religion, but it was not too long ago that when a man died, a Hindi man died and he was burning on the pyre, they would throw the wife on too, while she was alive. <laughs> because she just had no value. So until we start seeing value in ourselves beyond beauty and we stop spending all our 
money on these products, we're stuck in a box. If we keep believing that beauty is the only way to success and beauty is defined by physical sexiness and this one just delineated in such a tight, narrow way, we're not going to get anywhere. It's just continual subjugation of women. And with men, I will say that the incidence of eating disorders and plastic surgery is on the rise because women are gaining more and more momentum. They rely on men less in those traditional heterosexual couples only I'm talking about. Um, and so now men feel pressure not only to be financially secure, but also to be good looking. Does anyone know what the popular plastic surgeries are for men right now? My class knows, so you can't tell me. <laughs> what do you think? What body parts do you think they're beefing up? Pecs. Pecs are huge. Pecs and calf implants. Extremely painful, especially the pectoral implants. Bicep, I've heard, are quite <coughs> painful, but also quite popular. Eating disorders amongst teenage males are going through the roof. And this is not just wrestlers and jockeys. This is regular, old, young men, you know, doing what they do, trying to get a car, trying to get, you know. <laughs> you had something to say? Oh, yeah. Something I wanted to add, I was just looking at the second question you had. Mm -hmm. What does beauty mean in 2014? Mm -hmm. um, ethnic ambiguity is really something that everyone is, you know, really focused on now. Mm -hmm. We have to incorporate the fact that mixed race people are, you know, raising in numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that the ideals have changed in accordance to people's migration here mm -hmm. and, you know, the mixing of different races. So the ideals have shifted through time. Yeah, and they always to, do, yeah? Yeah, but mm -hmm. just ethnic ambiguity and complications with that as well. Yeah. Something that I wasn't sure if you were gonna address or. Ethnic, yeah. The ethnically ambiguous model is extremely popular right now. We love that mixed look, right? And we think that if you can't really tell what they are, they kind of get the boast of the, the, boast yeah, of yeah. World. <laughs> the best of both <laughs> worlds, right? And that's actually a pretty large growing market, especially with babies yes. and child modeling. They, you don't see as many white babies in ads now. You're getting Asian babies, black babies, brown babies. It's considered, I mean, who knows if it's reflecting a change or if it's just some sort of agenda. It's hard to say. Yeah. Well, um, I was gonna add to her, like also, um, like looking exotic, like, you know, yeah. that, is that. Sure. But um, uh, when you said, when you're talking about women being like bosses and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I was also gonna add that like, um, most of the time when women are like bosses, they're like considered like bitchy kind of, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or like if it's a guy, he's more like, oh, he's on top of his stuff, he's just, you know, doing his job. Yeah. yeah. I think that speaks to a lot of what's going on in the Atlantic article, which is actually an excerpt from a book that these two newscasters have written. Um, they're anchors, right? We've got a reporter from ABC News and one from BBC World News America. Um, and the idea is, yeah, that when men are aggressive, and authoritative and confident, we appreciate that. That's considered a virtue or a strength or a skill. Those same qualities in a woman are often perceived as bitchiness, right? Bitchiness, um, over opinionatedness, <laughs> all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that um, what you're talking about here is uh, there is a direct correlation between racism and sexism. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, because you were just saying right now about and how classes. women are perceived to be bitchy or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas the case of a man, he would be authoritative, yeah. assertive, and all that. But that applies also to non-white men. Absolutely. When there's a, a non-white man that has an opinion mm -hmm. that's you know strong or very you know out. Oh yeah. Well, you heard all, all of a sudden, black man, all, that all of a sudden, right? a non-minority man is a hothead. Hothead. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it happens. I mean, this is such a, a palimpsest of classism, racism, sexism. Um, consumerism, capitalism, all packed into this gnarly ball that we're trying to <laughs> kind of unravel, right? Well, I and, thought, yeah. and, and part of that really is uh, how we think about race. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, there's no such thing as race. There's race, right? There's no such thing as racist. There's only one race. Mm -hmm. Human. Human. Right. Yeah. However, uh, we talk about the white race or the black that race. That social construct. Rather, and those mm -hmm. are just generalizations at best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we treat them as their distinct categories. Oh, absolutely. Which they're not. Mm -hmm. Because then, if you're going to do that, you're going to have uh, not so white white, mm -hmm. the in-between white, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> medium brown, the darker brown, oh, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> There's and, well, such a hierarchy, and, right? And, I mean, uh, the best uh, approach for that, and that's just my opinion, is ethnics. That group of people, commonalities, uh, common culture. Sure, that, ethnicity versus that, that's race. That's an identifier. Absolutely. But as far as race goes, that makes more sense. That, of that's the too. problem. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, um, I want I wanted to say something to uh, the girl over there to relate. Um, 
There's a book, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it, Lean In by a Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the last thing. She's on the whole the very important. Mm -hmm. um, and that We're just talking about that in PR. Yeah, the same mm -hmm. exact concept about, um, you know, and we had talked about that in my humanities class as well, about the, you know, how different words are construed. And even the, I don't watch many movies like this, but the proposal with Sandra Bullock when she's the boss, uh -huh. um, they make her out to be like this devil, like yeah. horrible bit, where if it was a male, you know, she'd be, he'd be very assertive. Yeah. The authority is sexy, yeah. right, in a man, yeah. but not so. <laughs> It's frightening, right? Yeah. But that's the, you know, if anyone has heard of Helene Sissou, who's this uh, French philosopher, goddess of a woman, she has this um, line that I really like, and she says, nothing is more frightening than the taboo of the pregnant woman. Something about, like, that when a woman is pregnant, she is showing the full expression of the incredible strength and range of the female existence. And that's terrifying. And all of this, just like racism, is meant to kind of compartmentalize women. If you keep selling them constantly, constantly on this one idea, how can they ever hope to escape it unless they have other pots boiling on the stove? And I think that's really the only solution. If we're talking about trying to, to fix this, um, if, if it's possible, once we unpack the classism, the racism, the sexism, all of that, we're going to have to start not just diminishing the importance of beauty as it's defined by mass media, but maybe hyping up the importance of beauty, like actual beauty, the way we as real people see it in real life, right? And just like with the food industry, how Michael Pollan said, you vote with your dollars, you vote against this whole establishment with your dollars too. The less of these perfectifying and beautifying products you buy, the better for the next generation of women, the better for the next generation of men too. Have you guys noticed the preponderance of male grooming goods at stores now? So I remember going to the drugstore when I was dead, with my dad when I was little. There was like a little bit of Dapper Dan, maybe some, what was it called, like Gentleman's Club aftershave. Now you've got Bod, you've got Axe, you've got several high-end to low-end lines, and men are buying these. Like they're buying them how women are. So starting to work on men too. I don't know if that's going to be enough. Maybe once men are like, hey, wait a minute, I'm spending all my money. I used to have 12% in savings, and now I'm the same as my girlfriend, negative 1.5%. Maybe then we'll get somewhere. Yeah, Katie and then Jim. But it's also, like, for those of us who have kids or are in space with kids, it's not only bringing up the females to have a different perspective of themselves, but also the bringing males. up right. the males to have a different perspective of how they interact with females, how they view females, how they view themselves, because if we're still putting this focus on the females, we're still perpetuating Absolutely. the sexism that's right. playing into this cycle. So it's not just about changing us as females, it's coming it together has to be collectively yeah. and raising up. I mean, we have to change ourselves too, but then also, you know, changing our kids. To, because I have a son, so if Yeah, I'm, you have a son and a daughter. If, yeah, so, so if, it, if yeah. I'm doing this stuff with my daughter, but I'm not having these conversations with him too, he's more than likely going to grow up and have these images Absolutely. of women when there's a good chance my daughter would have a different self-image. You know? Definitely. So I have to do the work with both of them because yeah. they are having the same amount of impact. Yeah. On their well, and if life. every young mother did what you were doing, then we would be actually getting somewhere. And fathers. Yes. And fathers. <laughs> of course fathers. <laughs> Definitely. They're no less important. So, I mean, well, here, I have a couple more comments. I want to deal with those, and I'm tired of talking. So, yes, go ahead. Well, in line, I, that was beautiful. Um, you know, I, I really feel our our human need for all these isms that we've talked about today mm -hmm comes from our own feeling of powerlessness and unimportance. Yep. We just have this urge to be more important than the next person. Mm -hmm. And we find ways to do that. And so if we could somehow raise children to believe that they are important, each child, that's the only way we're going to escape this. I don't know how we to do to it. We have start touting other virtues and skills, right? Because this idea of perfection that not even the models who represent it can attain? Yeah. How can an actual human be expected to look the way a magazine app looks, right? And, and that pressure is immense, intense, and super detrimental. Yeah. Oh, thank you.
I think I can answer your third question. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's wrong with the current uh, beauty ideal? Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of had this lucky life in the sense that I've gotten to live through both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I was a professional runway model. Mm -hmm. I had that whole long blonde hair down the group for so long. Close to 5'10", but you know, mm -hmm. close enough. Uh, growing up, and uh, you know, had like company super easy, mm -hmm. you know, high school, four boyfriends, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I was 19, you know, I got cancer and uh, lost my hair, and I didn't, you know, tell anyone. I just said, hey, I shaved my head, and this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you know, after that, this whole entire world shifted on what beauty was. You know, mm -hmm. suddenly it wasn't, oh, you're not a model anymore. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're bald. And this is like, you're not. Yeah. Crazy. Did you do you feel that you were treated differently? I grew oh, up yeah, as a fat true. kid, and once the yeah. fatness melted off. It was a completely different world to me. And I think mm -hmm. that's when this started becoming, like I really saw that there is a huge difference between those who are considered beautiful and those who are not, and how unfair it is. Yeah, and it's stupid because it's you're like born how you're born, right? Yeah, in a sense, like, but there were other ways that I was too beautiful. In the sense yeah. Of, oh look, mm -hmm. you can't do that. Or you mm -hmm. know, like it's it was cool to see this other side of beauty that was way more beautiful. Yeah. Then you know, and I think that the current beauty ideal is, you know, people are stuck on, you know, bow or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then it's like you were saying, like walking around Greenway, we see this other side of beauty. Yeah. And that's yeah, the mass media beauty. ideal is not our ideal. And that's what's so offensive. They keep shoving it down our throats because we yeah. keep buying those products, even though in real life we don't expect I don't expect my students to come in being five ten and blonde. Nor would I appreciate them more if they they did, right? But it, it is again, it comes down to what we do with our money because that's the biggest kind of like variable there. The beauty thing isn't gonna change, at least not in one generation. Women since, you know, looking at Baroque nudes, women have always been positioned as the object of the male gaze, right? And that is going to probably persist until we start empowering women in ways other than their sexuality and their beauty. But that's, that's a tall order. And you see it, I think the problem is, is that we think of the media as reflecting what we actually feel, but they're not. And buying those products is telling them, yes, we buy into exactly what you're saying. I do need to be tanner. I do need to be thinner. My teeth need to be way whiter. They need to look like chiclets. They need to be so perfect, like Stanley Tucci in Hunger Games, right? And that's just not how teeth actually look. Yeah. Uh, it might be worth noticing <coughs> the phenomenon of male extreme sports. Not the yes, but, very but, good. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an unattainable ideal to uh, like throw yourself off a cliff on a mountain bike. Mm -hmm. If you have a serious fall, there's an instant like, six-figure repair bill. So mm -hmm. if your parents aren't rich enough to pay for that, uh, then you're nothing. Yeah, exclusivity again. That's Men used to do, I mean, and you can still see it in more agrarian or rural societies, that men, instead of the painful beauty ritual, they have a painful or terrifying uh, ritual kind of induction into manhood, whether it's the cutting off of the foreskin by an elder and then the gentleman being forced to consume his own foreskin. Um, the culture, I can't remember the name of the tribe that they build these enormous towers out of sticks and they tie a very elastic vine around their ankle and they just free dive off of it. Because that's what, you know, they have to show that they're men, just how beauty shows that we're beautiful women, right? We are beautiful, we are representative of women. Jim. Hey, uh, going back to the point, yes. I was just wondering, like, curtain was on the ground. Are you saying that media is suggesting that like, it's, like, their life increase gradually from the point that they want, and then when they shift the tape, they go down? I definitely think ageism, just to throw in another ism, <laughs> is a huge characteristic because now what's beautiful is childbearing age, that range. And you can see that in the 500 years of women in Western portraiture. All of the women have the rosy cheeks, full lips, full cheeks of young, fertile, ready to have kids sort of state, right? So older women, we don't allow older women's sexuality or beauty. We don't. We disallow disabled people from being sexual, dark skin, dark hair, all of those things. Um, we only have six minutes left, so Kevin, and then I'll get you, and then I'm sure you guys are roasting as I am. Yeah. I think it's a lot about, yeah, the whole thing about women, gals seeing that ideal image model thing. It's been going on for years. That's why they have counseling now. And they have girls go out, they get depressed, they get eating disorders, and they got to get help for their self esteem. The thing is, it's, it's, about, it's about ego, it's about thinking life is a competition. It's about humbling down. It's just a, it's a growing up and maturing thing. Sure, but I think that 
I mean, life kind of is a competition, unfortunately, right? There's well, that's a finite well, you number. Stop of, thinking that way, making it up. Uh, yeah, it a and they, I guess what, to, you know, what I'm trying to get at is you have to achieve this balance of realizing some things are this way and they're going to be that way and making the best out of it and then we're just denying the way things but are. Got, yeah? The person needs to live for themselves and who they are and know who they are and have confidence in themselves before they go around trying to impress people. Then they'll sure, but I think stuff. the problem with our society is that we don't that's really the truth. promote that you, idea. You you gotta have your own thoughts as a person, and you gotta stop worshiping the wrong thing. Okay, yeah. thank you guys. I'm sorry I didn't catch you before. Thank you.